hello Connor and hello viewers. This is a, a, a new endeavor for the channel. Are you doing all right this evening? I'm doing good. How about you, man? I'm doing I'm doing well. This probably looks different to uh, to people who have been watching the channel and and know my content, know my show uh, from camera to console, and you know maybe you've been tuning into the live streams. But this is a, a this is a new thing, an exciting new venture uh, that we're going on, and and we call this little project uh, make it a double, where we uh, basically I, I pick a a film, you pick a film, and we talk about the two films together. Film discussion. Film discussion, for the yes, internet. like sort of a yeah. There's there's actually like a dearth of <laughs> uh, of a film discussion stuff on YouTube, you know. And and for a couple of white dudes to throw their voices in there is very novel, very unique. And I feel that you know we can we can bring unique voices that aren't being heard, you know, to the conversation. Right. Right. <laughs> um, it, sort of in 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 my wildest dreams, maybe not that wild, but. Uh, Perhaps in the future, one of us can can throw out a film, and the other one will try to match that with an appropriate double feature that has some shared thematic or directorial or thespian connection. That's an actor. That's a fancy word for an actor. <laughs> fancy word for actor. Um, Got it. But this time, we just picked a couple of random movies, um, and the movies that we will be uh, talking about today, the, the movie that I picked uh, is Deadbeat at Dawn from 1988, and you picked? I picked uh, Shogun's Ninja or Ninja Bugai Bugaicho Momochi Sandayu from 1980. I'm going to let you kick us off and kind of break down, uh, to tell us about Shogun's Ninja, what it's about, and, and kind of your brief thoughts, and we'll go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So Shogun's Ninja is the tale of a, uh, a clan in Japan during a uh, uh, mixed, I want to say that time frame, uh, 16th century Japan. Uh, there is a clan that is being disparaged by uh, a power-hungry warlord uh, trying to get their secret gold mine. Um, and of course, the secret gold mine's map is located on an ancestral pair of swords uh, that has been passed down from leader to leader of this clan. So uh, your, your main antagonist, Hideyoshi, is on a quest to defeat the Momochi clan, acquire these swords, and gain access to this hidden gold mine of legend. Okay, so I'm gonna jump in right here and say that I'm very, I was already very confused about the names in in this, uh, in this movie because you referred to uh, the, the antagonist played by Sonny Chiba um, of, you know, Kill Bill fame and the Street Fighter series and stuff like that. Um, you referred to him as Hideyoshi, which is the first reference to him in my notes as well it, I, I have it written down here is his okay. name is okay. Hideyoshi. It got me too. I'm making sure it's not just me at this point because that got me right but he is credited as, and later in the film, they refer to him exclusively. I, ha I have IMDb pulled up. Uh, the Shiranui Shogun is what he is named. On March 15th, Law and Order ordered Hideyoshi to storm the Momochi Castle in Iga Province. Confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so I had no idea what this guy's name was or like who. He, I just I was just like when he's on screen, I know who what what Sunny Chiba looks like, and I'm like, oh, it's Sunny Chiba. He's the bad guy. Okay, he's the bad guy. That's fine. I mean, there are a lot of named characters in this movie. There are uh, side characters that have maybe 30 seconds of screen time get named in this movie, and it, it messes me up. So whatever his name is, Hideyoshi or Shogun or whatever, Sonny Chiba. Sonny Chiba is sent by Lord Oda, who I assume is Nobunaga Oda. Is it? Is it uh, supposed maybe? to be Oda Nobunaga? I don't know. They throw out a bunch of na like a historical names. I'm... I'm very weak on Japanese history, but like I know just enough to get me in trouble and like I would hear names of like Ieyasu and stuff like that and I'm just like, oh, I know that name. I'm sure that this is a, a complete butchering of Japanese history. I'm sure it is. So when I hear names like Oda, I'm just like, oh, no, Oda Nobunaga. Yeah, I know that, I know that, homie. He sends Sunny Chiba to the Momochi clan to kill them. They're in Ida Prefecture. And even the narrator even says that in Ida Prefecture, there are more ninja than commoners which is like what a way to live like, 
I don't want to be surrounded by assassins constantly, but but beyond that, so they go and they meet up with the the leader of the Momochi clan, and he is assassinated, uh, and he sends he tells his wife to to give their son Takamaru the the sword that contains what what we later find out is just one part of the map to their secret gold mine, the clan's secret gold mine, right? Uh, and then. Uh, Yatoshi, is that his name? The the retainer that, that I believe so. I believe his name is Yatoshi. Sure. I'm like ninety three percent sure. <laughs> that guy, old dude, the old, old dude. dude. <laughs> he 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 takes Takamaru away from the castle. Um, Momochi's wife commits seppuku, brutally. Uh, and he and comes back and watches his mom die on the floor. Just got to throw fair. that out there. I have to say, it's very, very stylish. I liked the flair. Like, I liked the, you know, there's a like a pool of blood and a flower and her knife, her tanto knife falls like slowly. There's a lot of directorial flair in this, which, which doesn't surprise me coming from Norifumi Suzuki, who... Uh, kind of made his career on style, the stylish pinky violence films early on, at least the stylish pinky violence films. He he did the first like three or four movies in the Delinquent Girl Boss, the uh, I think it's called Skeban Sukeban series, um, and then later on he did this comedy series called uh, Toraku Yaro, which is like tr truck dudes. It's like their comedy series about truck trucker guys. But there's this wonderful sequence when they go into the woods, uh, when they're trying to escape and they meet up with all these kids, and then there's child murder. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. Um, movies don't have enough child murder. In wow. <laughs> it, it's funny because like 10, 15 minutes into this movie, I'm, I'm already thinking like, wow, like so much is happening. So much has already happened. No, and totally. Just, there's, there's decapitation before you get the title sequence. Yeah, like it's intense. And you're like, oh, my, that's, that's crazy. And if you go to Wikipedia and you see like what their plot synopsis is, their plot synopsis covers like the first 15 minutes of the movie. So they talk about Takamaru, you know, he escapes and he goes to uh, China for a while, or I assume he, he, you know, he trains and he meets a girl, he gets a girlfriend. He meets like, a girl named Alin. Right, and she looks like Chun-Li and she's very cute and all this. And then like 10 years later, he comes back to Japan and you know, he's a, he's a verified badass. And that's where the Wikipedia summary ends. <laughs> I've tried watching the sub of it before and it doesn't tell the same story that I kind of grew up with with this movie. Uh, it's a little bit different, and there are just, there are particular um, moments with the English dubbing over this movie that make me cackle out loud. Um, the scene where, I, and I, I, I can't think of his name, he's one of uh, Takamaru's friends that, that he meets after he comes back from China. Um, but he looks at the camera and he has like this, this weird look on his face and he's like, you back, Master Takamaru! You're back, Master Takamaru! Let's talk about the weirdest thing about this movie. Okay. And you know what it is. Okay. It's the music. <laughs> what is with the smooth jazz funk soundtrack? It's incredible. I don't understand. It's pretty amazing, but only because of how incongruous it is with everything else. You can't tell me that when Takamaru first fights that group of samurai, like the pervy samurais that try and interrupt the kabuki show, you cannot tell me that that Dude, it's the, it's the piano and that slapping funky bass and that saxophone that just comes right in, cuts through everything. There, there is so much saxophone. Uh, there there's is not so enough much saxophone. saxophone. <laughs> that, uh, well, that's true. Absolutely, that's true. But, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> There's some other stuff in this that I feel like is a little bit ahead of its time. In that, uh, in that first street fight, there's some some slow mo and some speed ramping. 
which I didn't expect. Like that's a technique that we didn't see a whole lot of until 2000, something like that. You know, and this is this is almost 20 years before that. Uh, maybe even a full 20 years before that and I, I saw some speed ramping in there It's not in the rest of the movie, but in that fight right there There's some slow-mo and speed ramping stuff that I thought was like pretty um, pretty interesting So he is a he is a, a verified badass at this point he has uh, I could not uh, get over the Bruce Lee vibes that I got off of him like he he has a presence so similar to Bruce Lee to me and that's that's um Hiroyuki Sanada I was who, about to say did you know that was Hiroyuki Sanada yeah he doesn't even look like himself like he's he's broken through here in the states and been in a lot of stuff over here of course he was like he was in the Twilight Samurai which won uh, I believe it won uh, the Oscar for best foreign film the year that it came out but even beyond that like he was in Danny Boyle Sunshine uh, he was in the last Samurai with Tom Cruise uh, he had a small bit part in um, in Avengers even he yeah I mean he's been the dude's been around good for him to yeah, go like, from like this kind of movie all the way to like so many different things and like break into our market it's pretty awesome i mean i've been a big fan of him for a long time but i have i had until this i had seen nothing that was this early of his and like i said like he doesn't even like he's so young he doesn't look like the person that i know sure you know, yeah like, that i know yeah i think i think i um, saw this in my I, I was either in middle school or it was my freshman year of high school that i saw shogun's ninja for the first time and it blew me away like it was so weird and different from like kung fu movies and that was like my first like japanese samurai ninja action movie so i as far as its weirdness is concerned i think that like the it is it's very comic booky like it very much feels like it was based on a comic book which i don't believe it was um it's very I, historical I, fiction comic book like yeah yeah you know when when the characters are at their lowest point a sage shows up to train them. Just a, just a dude. A dude with a long, wispy white beard, and he's just like, I'm here to train you. <laughs> what did I tell you? I was like, at some point in the movie, a guy with wispy eyebrows and wispy beard shows up, and he's gonna montage train the <laughs> out of our, <laughs> our protagonist. To, to like a smooth jazz funk soundtrack, <laughs> you know, which makes it, <laughs> it makes it extra good. Beyond like the comic book logic and the and you know the smooth jazz sound of the weird incongruous music, um, knowing that it comes from Norifumi Suzuki, I kind of expected it to be weirder because like you're talking about a guy that worked in in pinky violence films, which are like you know I don't I'm, I haven't gone deep deep into the pinky violence stuff like I've really. Uh, this year, I watched the the Scorpion, the, the the female prisoner Scorpion films for the first time. Loved them. They're they're fantastic. The the Arrow box set is really really good. Which um, I believe some of them you can watch on Shutter. Yes. That uh, that whole genre of like uh, female centric exploitation films that are always about it's unfortunately it has to always be about like rape revenge type stuff. But like just just the sheer weirdness and the m music choices and like the compositions and like these. It's like it's it's Japan's Jalo, you know, like as as unique and uh, homegrown as that genre feels to Italy. Um, that's what Pinky Violence feels like to to me, you know, because the you know the 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 samurai stuff coming out of Japan was really largely just a take on you know westerns. You know, they were t they were pulling that stuff from from Hollywood. Um, but the Pinky Violence stuff feels so unique and so, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's so singular, I guess is the word that I'm looking for. Um, so yeah, knowing that he was a, you know, kind of a seminal figure in that genre and that movement of film in Japan, I kind of expected this to be weirder than it is. Um, not to say that it's not weird. Sure. It is. It's um, weird. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun, but there are too many characters. Yes. And it's two hours long. Yes, it is. The, the key takeaways in this movie, and I'm, I'm rewinding a little bit here, um, back when they they meet up, when Takamaru meets up with all his old friends from the Momochi clan, um, and they finally get together, and they get bum-rushed by the Koga Ninja for the first time, there is a scene, and it's one of the big takeaways for the movie for me, is all the weird f***ing one-liners, again, that just come out of nowhere where he screams, it's a dead cock, 
when he stabs, <laughs> he stabs into the door, <laughs> and thinking he kills yes. him, and blood like squibs out of the sword in the in the door, and it opens up, and it's just a chicken going. Bah, bah, bah. Yes, we get we can thank the the voice director for that, I guess, or the the scriptwriter on the English language script. Mm. I don't know that they intended for them to be funny, but well, I was gonna say they inevitably capture Takamaru and all that gang, and that torture scene is one of the weirdest torture scenes I think I've ever seen. So Takamaru is like strung up. Uh, and they're beating him with broken, uh, like, kendo swords, like, like basically just sl slicey bamboo sticks smacking him around. Um, everybody else is just kind of imprisoned, and they're trying to get information out of him. And uh, I can't believe we failed to mention this. Sunny Chiba's character, Hida Yoshi or whatever Shogun guy, has two children he raised from birth. One is deaf, one is mute. They're creepy as and they pinch the sh** out of Takamaru to try and get him to talk. And it's real strange. They're just... They also have the worst haircuts I've ever seen. Because they're like, it's like almost bald, like it's peach fuzzy that you can see through. And then it like just goes, they look like Kappa to me. Yeah, they kind of do. Yeah, yeah. I got to say, if I wasn't taking notes about like every single thing that happened in the movie, no, I would be... I would be lost. I would be total. By the end of the movie, I'd be like, those cool fight scenes, some weird music. I don't know. <laughs> Dude, I had to as well because it's one of those movies where, like, I can't just, like, follow everything that's going on because there's so many intermittent like random scuffles and fights throughout it like just random like oh this dude just hit somebody for literally no reason in this moment and a fight ensues and it's like what were these people's names and what was the motivation for the fight i'm trying to understand and i'm trying to follow but okay uh very important here uh sunny chiba grabs takamaru's balls and in yes in another movie street fighter Sonny Chiba performs Monkey Steals the Peach on a gentleman, and he rips his balls off in that movie. So I don't know what it is about Sonny Chiba movies and grabbing people's balls and ripping them off or torturing them that way, but that's just a thing I've noticed. That's a trend. It must be his trademark. He's just like, listen, um, I, I signed a contract to be in this film, and you know, you know what that means. Did you read the writer? I have to grab balls in the film. You better write in a ball grabbing scene. Uh, fa fast forwarding a little bit there, uh, after everybody's been captured and uh, Takamaro eventually does this cool ass candle trick where he grabs a candle with his teeth and burns the rope and frees himself. That's a great sequence. I love the escape sequence there. He breaks out, he eventually jumps out of a building, lands flat on his back in the river and that looked painful as hell whoever that stuntman is i hope he got extra that day because it may have been him <laughs> we come back to them getting ready to oil burn oil boil the prisoners alive in front of a crowd um and there's a, a small bit of information prior um uh, one of the gentlemen that was part of the momochi clan his wife sold out the clan which is why the koganinja found them and then she tried to manipulate him by telling him i'm pregnant don't leave me this weird scenario happens right and he you know, gets the stones to be like, it was me, it was my fault that all this happened. And he just jumps in the boiling oil right in there and just everybody starts screaming and then a fight ensues. You know, I said that, that Sanada had Bruce Lee presence and he had Bruce Lee energy. And I do I do think that he does bring a similar kind of spirit to, the, to this role, um, but he doesn't have the skills and he doesn't have the speed, obviously, that Bruce Lee does, but the choreography otherwise is pretty fun and good. There's a little bit of wire work and stuff in there. Which and, is really you funny know. when you notice a wire, because it ha you'll see him a couple times, and when you do, you're like, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> like, yeah, and it's it's amazing that you can see them, because the transfer that I watched was probably ripped from a VHS, and I could still see the wires, so. <laughs> that's true, that's true. This is available on DVD. I don't think it's ever gotten a restoration. It's not on Blu-ray anywhere that I know of. Um, but yeah, I would I would be interested to see this cleaned up because it is really stylish. I think it's a good looking movie overall. 
Um, and I think it deserves that treatment. I think it feels like, you know, before you mentioned this to me, I didn't know of this movie. So um, it feels a little forgotten considering that it's it's got, you know, Sonny Chiba in it and um, Hiroyuki Sanada, um, who has, has made a name for himself in Hollywood. It's, it's, it's interesting that this hasn't... Um, you know, been restored and, and marketed as like, hey, there's this movie that these, the dude that was in Kill Bill, remember that guy? And then there's this other guy who was in Sunshine, he's in Avengers, remember him? He's cool. Yeah, so I think this is probably uh, on some boutique Blu-ray labels list uh, to get restored at some point if they can find a master. Like I said, man, it, it was one of my favorite uh, martial arts action films growing up. Just it was so wacky and weird. And um, one of the few that like I actually prefer the English dub uh, just because of how goofy it is. Like and the, the mix is just it's fun. It's just overall like if you like campy, you know, uh, uh, Eastern films with like Kung Fu, Samurai, Ninja, all thrown in there. You like people digging underground and popping up and slicing people? This is the movie for you. Huh? Ah, it's a dead cop! We also watched a movie at, at my request. We watched uh, Deadbeat at Dawn from 1988, uh, directed and starring and written by, catering by probably, I don't, I'm not sure, Jim Van Beber. Um, very, very much a lo-fi uh, passion project by a guy who took out a whole bunch of loans, school loans, I even believe, um, dropped out of school, took his school loan money, and over the course of several years, I, I believe- I think it was four years. Maybe, yeah, like four years, um, he made this uh, weird gang-centered, a white gang, white white boy gang, <laughs> white boy gang-centered ex- Robocop cop game but yes yeah like it's it's about a, a, a gang leader he's the leader of a gang called the ravens and his name is goose played by jim van bever uh and he gets in frequent kerfuffles with the rival gang the spiders led by a guy named danny boy uh and uh the movie basically starts with uh you know the spiders are moving on to their territory which in this case happens to be a cemetery. A cemetery. It's a f***ing cemetery. <laughs> That's the term. Um, so they go out sporting some goofy masks. Uh, Jim Van Beber has like a little like cheap black masquerade mask on. And Danny has like a... A Batman logo? Yeah, it's a like a modified spray painted Batman Halloween mask it looks like. It's got like th places cut out of it. I don't know. Very strange. Uh, they they ditch the masks early on and they fight, you know. And there's you know knife play and gun play, and the dude gets his fingers blown off, and um, and it's basically just just kind of like watching Goose like struggle with the the gang life, and he's got this girlfriend named Christy who's just like you got to leave that old life behind. And he's like, what do you know? You're what? And she's all into like woo woo voodoo magic stuff, and she's like, wear this cross. It's it'll protect you. All like Santeria and like you know all all kinds yeah. of occult stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I wanted you to watch this because this was, um, as I understand it, I came to this late. I understand that this was kind of like a B-movie holy grail kind of thing on VHS. Uh, it was the only way you could see it for a long time was just, just on VHS. And then Arrow put out a fantastic restoration uh, on Blu-ray. I picked it up because I had heard good things about it and finally watched it a couple of years ago. It blew my mind. Just, you know, it's very low rent. The performances aren't great, but there's, there's a real like cinematic competence to what he's doing. Like they, like he understands the language of film, like how the pieces fit together, how, how, you know, moving sequences become compelling over a series of cuts and movements. Um, and I just, I think it's just a really kind of remarkable piece of, of filmmaking from a guy who had like zero resources. Um, but I'm curious to hear what you what you think about it because I, I understand that it what it didn't go over super well in your home. <laughs> <laughs> no, it did not. And um, uh, Lara says F you <laughs> for making her watch. Sorry, it. sorry, Lara. Um, and uh, uh, I loved it, man. Like I absolutely enjoyed every second of it. Uh, it was a psychedelic, drug fueled mind melting trip through cemetery kung fu um it was just 
I, I, I came away with so many questions uh, unanswered, and I feel like I will never know the answers to those questions, and that makes it all That's what you said. Better. You texted me. You texted me the other night, and you were just like, I just watched Deadbeat at Dawn, and I have so many questions, and I kind of, I, I, I want to know what your questions are. Like, <laughs> Why the f*** does the movie start out with a police officer literally do nothing about a sexual assault happening in a car right at the beginning of the movie? Uh, he's like, hey, stop that. The movie starts with Goose's girlfriend, Christy, going to see a fortune teller. Um, and the fortune teller says something mysterious and cryptic about death or doom, doom, doom saying doom. type stuff, right? And so she, she leaves and then she's assaulted by Danny, who's the leader of, of the rival Spiders gang. Um, and then, a, like you said, a cop comes along and he's just like, what are you guys doing? What are you doing in there? Um, and Danny's just like, nothing, it's just my wife. You Give know, my wife a kiss, officer. And Christy's like, it's fine, and she leaves. Shortly after that, Danny Boy is with his girl um, and tells her that he's going to suck her eyeballs out. I'm gonna pull your eyeballs out of your head and eat them. They take every opportunity to make sure that you know that Danny, between the two of Jim Van Beber, Goose, and Danny Boy, that Danny Boyle, Danny Boyle, not Danny Boyle, <laughs> Danny Boy, sorry Danny Boyle, I love you, uh, Danny Boy is the shit heel, right? Um, not that Goose is without fault. No, you Goose know, is also a shit heel. I said I'm going out, I'm going out, I don't need some crank-headed shit telling me what to do. There's a very poignant scene, uh, not poignant, pointed scene uh, where he is cutting the tips of these bullets right before the gang fight in the cemetery. I'm not a gun guy, but yes, I believe that what, that what it is is that if you, when you cut bullets like that, when they hit their target, they spread like on the inside and they just cause more damage. He doesn't even use guns no, that much. No, he doesn't even really dude, use the guns. Dude, dude is all about the chucks. He is all about the chucks, and that was my next point: is um, that the, the scene following some of this kerfuffle that happens, and he's like gets upset at his girlfriend in the house, and he leaves for a hot minute. He goes to the cemetery and practices kung fu uh, by himself. <laughs> he's got to he's got to center himself. He's got to center himself in the cemetery by practicing the kung fu. Uh, and I gotta be real, dude knows how to use the chucks. Uh, he's, yeah. he's like actually legitimately good with them. And that yeah, kind of that's why me. he uses them in the movie because Jim Van Pepper knows how to use nunchucks. He knows how to use nunchucks. And like when I saw it, because like all the fighting you had seen before that was like, ah, scuffle, you know, blow a guy's hand off, squibs, you know, fun, right? Um, but then you see him by himself and he's whipping those nunchucks around his body like a pro. And I'm like, what the f***? Like, is this gonna be good? Like, what is happening? <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't sure. What did you think this was gonna be? Like, before you watched it, that's I kinda... didn't know what to expect at all. I read nothing about it. I left it alone. I came into it blind because that was kind of the impression that you gave me to just watch the movie and just be there. That's how I came into it. Like, I I didn't really know anything about it either. I just I had heard that it was good. It was kind of a B movie classic. Like, if you're if you're into like exploitation films and stuff like that, you gotta see Deadbeat. And uh, and I was just like, all right, let's give it. A I bought, I like blind bought it and everything, gave it a whirl, and yeah, blew my mind. I think that Hobo with a Shotgun borrowed very heavily from this movie. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. I'm not a big fan of that movie. It's one really? of those. Yeah, it's one of those cases where I feel like, I don't know. I feel like you can't intentionally make a B movie. I don't know that that's ever successful to me. And that's one of those movies that's just like, it feels like the filmmakers went out and they're just like, we're gonna make a B movie, it's gonna be fun and like grotesque and like we're intentionally, we're gonna put a film grain filter on it. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. Maybe I need to revisit it. I only saw it one time and I love Rutger Hauer and I, you know, I hear a lot of people talking about how good it is. People talk about how good Rubber is too and I hated that movie. Um, which is a similar kind of thing where it's just like, it's too cute for its own good because it knows what it's trying to be. But the greatest B movies, aren't trying to be B movies, they're just trying, they're, they're doing their damnedest to be movies with very little resources and sometimes talent. <laughs> so, and that's what makes them um, great. I don't know, like I, that Grindhouse thing that, that Robert Rodriguez and Tarantino did um, a while back when I was in college, uh, 
you know, I came away from that feeling like Tarantino was the only one who kind of got it. Uh, because, you know, Robert Rodriguez went in there and he was like, I'm going to make a B movie. And then you watch it and you're just like, eh, it's, it's about as good as like middle of the road trauma, I guess. Um, and then you watch uh, Death Proof and it's like, oh, this is just a Quentin Tarantino movie. He's not trying to make a B movie. He just, he has a plot that's kind of B movie-ish and he just made a Tarantino movie, which is like, you know, it was very simple, very streamlined, good performances, good stunts and stuff like that. And you know, I, I, I gotta say when, when I watch something like Dead Beat at Dawn and then go back and watch something that is like purposeful B movie grindhouse style, I can see where something like Deadbeat at Dawn is not going to be acceptable to a wider audience. They're not going to enjoy it the same way that they may enjoy the concept of a B-movie uh, watching something like Hobo with a Shotgun, which I think has, has a bigger audience available for it for what it is, contextually and visually. Um, Going into Deadbeat at Dawn, I'm surprised that Lara sat with me the whole movie because whew, that shit. Lara is your for, for Claire, Claire, Lara is your your girlfriend. yes. Lara is my girlfriend. Uh, if you have watched any of the streams I've appeared on here, uh, I talk about her frequently because she always has an opinion of something that me and Dustin are doing. So um, I feel like I came to it late for sure, and I was like, why haven't I seen this movie before? This is made for someone like me. 100% because it gives me all those oogie nasty vibes I get from like a Death Wish movie or like Robocop but it, it gives me that grit and that that campy self-made feeling that I that I have been searching for since the days of Hollywood video right where I would randomly pick yes. indie titles off the shelf well I think I think that you know you you're you're touching on something that I feel like makes B movies so interesting, and especially like exploitation films and things like that, or like really f grimy and gross, like forgotten horror films and stuff, is that when you have no frame of reference for what you're getting into, the transgressive feels truly transgressive. And watching something like Dead Beat at Dawn, which is just a, a dude's passion project and he's like this is just a movie that I wanted to make and it doesn't feel like it's trying to be anything in particular it doesn't feel like it's I mean like it's it's such a pastiche of like you know of so many like influences from like kung fu movies to like gang movies and to like I guess exploitation films but it doesn't even feel like he's again he's not trying to make an exploitation film he just made a he just made a movie so that's what makes that stuff feel more sh more shocking to me but then when i watch a movie called hobo with a shotgun <laughs> i'm just like okay so we're gonna see some limbs blown off with a shotgun. it doesn't it feels safe it feels safer because they're just like this is what we're doing we're making this thing that's like you know not not to so. put on par hobo with a shotgun with something like sharknado because i i genuinely do love hobo with a shotgun oh. but, but no sharknado, hobo with a shotgun is way better than the sharknado stuff that's a whole different realm of like trying too hard the to be effort to make something bad on purpose yeah. defeats the purpose of making something bad if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't think the people who made Hubble with a Shotgun were trying to make a bad movie. They were trying to make a B movie. The people who make Sharknado movies are trying to make bad movies because they think that that's what people like us want to watch. And we don't want to watch a movie that's intentionally bad. We want to watch movies that are unintentionally and entertainingly bad. And there's a big difference. I don't want to watch something and feel secondhand embarrassment for like, well, sometimes I do. I don't know. It depends on how earnest it is. Like when I, when I watch like The Room or what, you know, that's the go-to. When I watch The Room or whatever, I definitely feel like a sense of secondhand embarrassment for some, the, the poor actress. <laughs> I frequently, when I'm watching like some really shitty, like shot on video type Polonia Brothers level type stuff, and some young lady starts taking off the whatever. I'm like, honey, no, not for this. Not for this. <laughs> Move back, getting back to Debbie to Dawn. Um, some of the things I love about this movie, I love like the kaleidoscope like transitions. It kind of, um, it kind of gives it that sort of psychedelic vibe. Like, you know, it's shot on 16 millimeter, so it looks grainy, it looks rough. I think that all adds to kind of the the experience, of course, but beyond that, like there's some really great lighting, some really like colorful lighting, lots of reds and greens and blues and stuff like that. Um, you know, maybe even in an era where he maybe not didn't have access to like Jello, 
films or something, but very much reminds me of um, of the visual aesthetic of, of a lot of like the, a lot of those Italian thrillers that are incredibly stylish, right? Um, but yeah, the the choreography is really good. That last man, that last fifteen minutes is just a barn burner of a sequence. Jess was out of town. Jess is my wife. Um, Jess uh, was out of town when I watched this for the first time, and I was admittedly a little, you know, drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Down here in the in the den watching it by myself and um, really enjoying it. Like, I really enjoyed the, the film up to that point, but you hit that graveyard hallucination sequence where the dude brings out the corpse of his yes. girlfriend and she's a skeleton and it's gross and it's very You're digging her in her brain and sh yep that's the moment that's when that's when the movie breaks and loses its own mind and from then on the last like 15 20 minutes is nuts yeah and that last shot of him crawling out of the alley you know hitting the ground i literally stood up from the couch by myself and applauded. I gave the film, I gave the film a standing ova ovation in my home. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think I gave it a holy. F <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those are those are some of my favorite. Like when you go on Letterboxd, I'm a I'm a big Letterboxd user. Um, go on Letterboxd. My favorite reviews of this movie are the people who just are totally blindsided by it. And I'll, there are a ton of reviews on there of people that just, it's two words. Holy shit. That's it. Yeah. You know? But that's the feeling it definitely leaves you with. Like that, that movie, it, it ends extremely strong. Extremely strong. If you're watching this, wait for the graveyard sequence. If you haven't seen this, we're spoiling the hell out of it. But when you get to the graveyard sequence, buckle up. <laughs> because it's about to go down. Um, and even, you know, despite the silliness, that, not that I don't have complaints about the movie, the performances are, you know, he didn't have professional actors, really. Like, he didn't have a, a lot of resources. You want some beer? Is that all the money you've got? Share this beer. And then I got some more beer back at my place. Nah, I'm kind of tired of beer. Um, I'm supposed Come to meet on. some friends. You, I, you said that there weren't necessarily amazing actors in this film. And I want to contest that because Bone Crusher is one of my okay. favorite <laughs> cinematic performances I think I have ever seen. <laughs> Bone Crusher's monologue is timeless. I hate people. And I don't care! I just don't fucking care. I don't care. No, I am the baddest motherfucker you ever saw, man. Bone Crusher, to me, is also almost more of an antagonist than Danny is in some ways. He's, I feel like he's way more, uh, is it unhinged or is it he just, he feels like a, he's more of a burnout. He's definitely more of a burnout. He's broken. He's definitely. Her intestines look like snakes. Little. Snakes coming out of her skin. Come on out, little snake. Come on out, little snake. Ooh. Snakes coming out of her stomach. Oh. He's broken. He's less aware of his surroundings. I think that he's probably more. Yeah, like he he's a he's a he's more of a burnout than Danny. Danny has more control of his crazy. I think. Um, but Bone Crusher is definitely like a loose cannon, uh, and that's. Yeah, so he, he does, he, I'm not saying that the performances are not fun, you know, I'm just saying that maybe they don't have the nuance of... <laughs> there, there, there might have been a little sarcasm in there, but it, uh, uh Bone Crusher's the one that kills his girlfriend, uh, uh, eventually, you know, and then, and then, yes, and then he does throw her body in a trash compactor. That's right, this is what Goose does, this is what our, this is what our hero, this is what our hero does, is that... His girlfriend is killed by rival gang members, and he, weeping, because he he's sad, you know, he's sad. <laughs> he's carrying her body through the streets, weeping, and throws her into a public trash compactor and pushes the button, and and like there's bone crunching sounds and stuff, and he's just like, oh, I'll miss you so much. Let, let, me, like, let me show you the face that I saw when I turned and looked at Lara. So listen, I've 
I've recommend this recommended this to two of my other friends, like from work and stuff like that. Uh, and both of them independently of each other came back to me and they said, yo, why did he throw his girlfriend's body in a trash compact? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Jim Van Beber, man. His mind is a maze. Don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so what I was getting to was like, after that, after his girlfriend dies, which is sort of like the inciting incident for like his emotional journey and, and what happens from there, the movie does kind of meander a bit. Like he's a, he's a mopey puss, you know, walking around the city crying and stuff. And he, he ends up back at his dad's apartment and his dad is like a junkie, bur paranoid junkie burnout too. Um, who shoots heroin between his toes and, and shit like that is constantly trying to get money from his son. He tries to fucking kill himself in an alley oh, yeah. and he asks the guy across from or the guy across from him is like, hey man, what are you gonna do with that gun? And he just looks at him and he goes, I'm gonna kill myself. And he's like, all right. What are you gonna do with that gun? I'm gonna shoot myself. Oh, all right. Yeah, cool with me. Yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> that's. I think that's when the movie picks up again. Is like, well, kind of after that. You know, Keith picks him up and keeps him. You know, uh, prevents him from killing himself. Brings him back into the fold. You know, somebody else has taken over the Ravens. This character named Keith, um, and he has brought the gangs together and doesn't realize that Danny is going to betray them after they pull off a. Uh, uh, an armored car heist. The armored car heist is 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 really fun. He repels from a from a uh, a parking garage and throws this giant ninja stars these shooting can at the at the guards. Um, and then you know they they break up and they have this big party where there's a topless girl there who's just doing this. Goose is a really good guy. As he goes over to the topless girl, and he's like, why, why don't you get out of here? Why don't you get out of here? So she leaves um, because Goose is such a good dude, right? Um, so after the, the heist, they have this party uh, and those are the Ravens having their own party and they're talking about meeting back up with the spiders later on to split the cash. So they go to this split up meetup and that's when the uh, the spiders betray them. They backstab them and they ambush the uh, the the ravens. And I'm I do they kill all of them except for Goose? Except for Goose, yeah. Because I don't I didn't see any of them. None of them appear later on in the movie. Like that's it. Goose is the only one left. Can we talk about the grandma? Goose grabs the cash, runs out, goes to this little like uh, mechanic shop and gets a drink, steals it's like a, a soda drink. Yeah, that's right, steals a Sprite, drinks a soda, the dude's like, you gotta pay for that. And then like he, you know, he, he, he harasses the dude. And then the little old lady pulls up with her son or grandson or something. Look, it's a robbery! Give me your gun, Grandma. Comes out of the car firing, shoots the gas station attendant, and just, she's screaming at him to kill the guy. Shoot him, shoot him through the head! Okay, so yeah, so after he, he takes the money, he, uh, Goose goes and he, he wants to give it to uh, his girlfriend's sister that she has not talked to in years or whatever, right? To kind of, you know, patch that up. He knows that he's doomed. He's, he doesn't care. And, and then he chases down Danny and there's this incredible sequence where he's like got his arm stuck inside the window of a car that's driving through an alley, dragging him along this brick wall. There's a throat rip that's just... Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's fantastic. Well, it's the, it's the that entire sequence at the end there that's the, like, 40 shanks and then the flip onto the car and then him yes. just digging his hand, like, right into his throat and just pulling things out. It's great. The whole, the whole sequence is fantastic. Like, starting at the train station where he's, like, doing the chucks and, like, kicking ass all over the place and doing wall runs and backflips and I mean the dude was incredibly athletic and and really knew what he was doing and you know even though Van Beber like as a director shows extreme competence you know behind the camera he's in front of the camera for the whole film he stars in it so um I feel that Mike King who is the cinematographer on this deserves a lot of credit for making this movie look and feel the way it does because there are some 
great camera moves, really great dolly shots and trucking shots, and you know, just a, a lot of very evocative camera movements um, that that make this movie what it is. And I just think that like as much credit as people would give Jim Van Bever, which I'm, he is do he is owed that, yes. Um, but I think that Mike King also deserves a lot of credit for for basically running the show. Like when your director's in front of the camera, I mean he can direct actors and stuff like that, but he's not watching the monitor, you know. And and your 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 DP is is uh, essentially a is director. really behind yeah behind the wheel at that point. So um, yeah, credit where credit's due. But yeah, just overall, I think it's. Um, if you if you like exploitation movies and and B movies and movies that like, if you're in our realm of interest with like horror stuff and trans transgressive stuff and you know weird things that have kind of been lost you know to time and whatnot, um, Deadbeat at Dawn is absolutely a a, a must watch. Yes, yeah. on Shutter as well. It is on Shutter. It is on Shutter. So Not endorsed Shutter. by Shutter. I just I use it a lot. Not yet sponsored by Shutter. Shutter, sponsor us. 